Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to Outside the Studio. I am so excited to introduce you to our very special guest today. We have psychic medium Bill Phillips here to join us, who is the author of several books, one of which is out recently, and we will talk in depth about it. It's called Soul Searching, Tune In to Spirit and Awaken Your Inner Wisdom. And among other works of Bill's are Expect the Unexpected, Signs from the Other Side. And um, so his life's mission really is to help people deal with grief of losing loved ones by bringing through validations, evidential information, and beautiful messages from spirit. Um, And he's been on television programs like Dr. Phil and Access Hollywood. So really and truly, we have a celebrity on the show today. (laughs) I don't know if he's rolling his eyes at me, if you can see him. <laughs> um, Phil, I mean, Phil, doctor. I've got Dr. Phil on my head. Bill, <laughs> how are you doing today? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like I said, it's an honor. Um, so I I kind of want to dive into the, even though, like, from what I've read from Soul Searching, I haven't, and maybe I haven't gotten to that place yet, but I haven't seen anything in here specifically about color, but we started to talk about this before we hit record. And we were, you were saying you liked my nail color. I'm wearing like this kind of like a sky blue color and it matches if you're just listening to the podcast, um, it matches Bill's shirt. And he was saying, oh, it's my color. I found it interesting to hear him say that because I was, I had color on my mind for some reason before we started to record. So So, Bill, I was curious if you have any thoughts in particular about color as it relates to your work or thoughts about color as it relates to healing or thoughts about color as it relates to anything. I mean, you said it's your color. So what did you mean by that? (laughs) Absolutely. It's a great question. And, you know, um, every day of my life, I'm always visualizing around me different energy sources. And so um there's days where I'll go you know I want to feel more uplifted today so I'll put on a brighter color and it instantly changes my mood and my whole demeanor um but also when I'm visualizing um in meditation let's just say you know and I'm working with spirit um different colors come to mind you know and so there is a language of color as well that um definitely is definitely is communicated from the other side and so Sometimes it can be so just elementary with how spirit wants to give that information through these different charades. And, um, you know, we're talking about color. So it's reminding me of um, a reading I gave a couple of years ago to this client. Um, and during the session, her um, her loved one was talking about blue with me. And so I was like, you know, I keep seeing blue. Does that mean anything to you? And she's like, no, not really. But at the end of the session, she had a question for me. Her dog had passed away after her loved one did. I'm like, sure, I'll check for you. What was your dog's name? And she goes, Blue. And then it hit her on the head like, oh, my gosh, there's the blue, you know. So um, this this um, this work for me is always so uh, amazing because I'm never sure what to expect when I'm doing it, you know. And I find that spirit's always in the background, making it a lot more easier um, on me, the medium, than, than I don't always know at the time of, but it's always interesting how they choose to bring through information. It's usually the very simplistic meanings that have the most powerful effect um, in a message as well. So, yeah. Oh, that's so cool. I love that. Yeah. Those synchron- yeah. synchronicities are just uh, amazing. I find that when something like that happens to me personally, it's like a felt sense in my body. It makes me feel really dropped down into typically heart space or sometimes in my gut. Um, but that's one of the things that I find so cool about this work is that it that's instantaneously gets me out of my head and into my body. Um, so I wanted to, I, I heard, I've heard you talk about this a little bit in, um, on your video blog about how you came to find this work of psychic. Um, and I'd love it if you could just share a little bit about your story, your origin story with listeners who might not have heard of you yet. Sure. And, you know, the term psychic, medium, intuitive, they're always used kind of interchangeably, you know, in in this world that we're living in. I like to call myself a channel, basically, a channel for spirit, you know. Um, But this really began for me uh, many years ago. I was um, 
a small child having experiences, not sure what to make of those experiences. My mother told me I watched too many scary movies. So of course, I began to believe that, you know, that that mantra and that programming. And so um, there was a period of time where it was a little bit more dormant, you know, as I went through, um, probably because of fear, which I think is very natural as well with people that are coming into their own natural gifts. Um, but uh, long story short, um, my mother took me across the country when I was six for my dad. It was a big turmoil there. And uh, we had a difficult time in New York for about three years. Um, just really trying to fend for ourselves. Um, my mother had addiction issues in this life. And so um, I was sent back to the, to the West Coast and then I was kept from her for almost six years. And then um, I was able to fly out and see her um, on her deathbed basically six years later and say goodbye to her. It was such a, um, such a, a, a grief moment, such a painful experience for me, but um, little did I know that I would wake up a few nights later to her in the room with me. And so through this, um, through this trauma that happened, it was, uh, there was this, this opening, this gift that came with it of her being there with me to show me and to guide me on my journey. And I, I, I always tell people I was not you know, I, I didn't um, want to be a medium as a child or as a teenager or, you know, it was something that I really ran from for many years. I was training to be an opera singer in my teenage years, actually. And so I wasn't ready to really um, go down that path yet. And so I, I went to a music conservatory and was was kind of going with the flow of life. Um, and of course, uh, spirit followed me there. <laughs> and um I found myself um, giving readings to people when I was in school. And what I found was that what was happening during those sessions was truly helping people in a way that I couldn't really explain. But um, it was very clear to me when I was finished that it was my path, you know, and it was my calling. So I trusted spirit and, you know, gave into it. And here I am today, all these years later. Mm. That's so cool. I love hearing origin stories because I find it so, especially when I speak with people like you, who's clearly following their calling and listening to that intuitive voice. Um, because I think so many of us allow the fear to take the steering wheel. And I am speaking definitely for myself here when I say that. And then we find, at least this is what happened to me. I'm, I'm sure so many people can resonate with this, you know, especially in my seminal years, like going through college, feeling very bright eyed, I guess, innocent for lack of a better word and hopeful about the future. And then slowly starting to feel this kind of jaded weight of adulthood creep in. And so I'm wondering, um, you know, in knowing like when I was a child, I definitely felt similar to you that I had these gifts that were kind of scary to me, but that I felt like this is something that comes naturally to me. This is something that I can see people enjoy when I do it. And it's something that I'm sure I would enjoy doing for the rest of my life, but it felt scary. And so um, personally, I chose to definitely walk away from that path. And I went into the corporate realm for many, many years. And now I feel like I'm finally doing by do by way of doing this work on outside the studio, coming back to myself, coming home to, um, what it is that really calls to me and speaks to my soul. And so I guess I'm wondering, probably advice for both young people, you know, making that decision on the precipice of maybe going to college, on the precipice of graduating from college, on the on the decision making path in terms of career. Um, and then maybe somebody who's in that job and they're like, oh, this just isn't right. You know, something's not fulfilling. There's got to be more than this you know, from both lenses of young, old, innocent, jaded, um, what advice might you give to those, those people on those precipices? Yeah, this is a really big reason why I wrote Soul Searching, because I wanted to show people how to access their inner child as well, because their inner child is your connection to spirit and the source energy. Um, and so, you know, we live in a society where we are taught things like how to, you know, um, write checks, you know, and do math equations and things that we don't always necessarily use in the outside world. 
But there's also a programming that comes along with that from a very early age, typically, you know, of like having to go to school and work hard and go to college. And so what I find now is that as the world is changing so rapidly, um, and especially over the past couple of years, too, what, what we're realizing is that we don't have to go with, you know, we, 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 we can go against the grain, basically, of what we thought we were supposed to do growing up. And so for anyone who's listening right now, who's in that space of, you know, I'm doing this right now, but my heart's not in it, you know, or I'm in this relationship, but my heart's not in it. This is all about trusting your internal dialogue, you know, and, uh, trusting your intuition, trusting your connection to your um, to your higher self. And what's so amazing about each and every one of us on the planet right now is that we all have the ability to tune into that energy. Once we recognize what that looks and feels like, and we recognize how innate it is in, inside of ourselves, we begin to give it more power and more credence, and it begins to grow in power as well. So my advice would be, listen to the thoughts and the feelings that keep repeating themselves to you, because What's going on is that you're being given guidance by spirit. They're putting the signs in front of you. But if you're not willing to be present with that information, you know, then you'll keep going through life sort of in that sort of fear module. But if you're able to recognize what's being given to you, like these breadcrumbs from heaven, so to speak, then you can make those decisions. You know, you can formulate and trust that you are here to truly co-create your journey of life. And I know for um, many people that don't understand that realm, it may seem kind of taboo to them of like, all right, okay, I can think it and feel it and attract it and that type of thing. But it really is a natural part of who we are. And when we, when we view life in that way and when we play with the magic within ourselves, that's when we decide to make decisions that are right for us um, but may not be right for those around us. And I think that's the hardest part in the beginning is trusting what's right for ourselves. Mm, yeah. This this makes me think of kind of the next step in that is, okay, now we're listening to our intuition. We're following the breadcrumbs. We're finding that maybe the people we have surrounding us are no longer serving us. Perhaps we're in toxic relationships. You talk about this in the book about letting go of toxic relationships um, and why it's such an important part of truly living the life we desire. So I wanted to pull on that thread a, a little bit more in terms of like, okay, I know I need to let go of this relationship. Now I'm seeing that it's truly toxic. Or maybe we even can't even articulate that quite yet, but you know something's kind of off, right? So this practice of letting go, this acknowledging that I need to let something go, that something needs to shift can we can we unpack that a little bit? You know, how how do you approach that? How do you suggest people approach that? It's a great question. I, I really believe that it first comes down to having an awareness of what's going on, you know. And I feel like a lot of times when we're in a relationship or a situation that is not serving us, that's draining us, um, it can at times become codependent as well, you know, where we feel like we need to be in that space or perhaps we're being um programmed or given information that makes us feel like we have to stay in that space because it's safe for us and our ego is designed in a way that likes that safety net it likes that comfort so it's really about understanding that for anyone who's in that situation right now or who was as well the first step in it is acknowledging it and then creating an intention with it as well you know or maybe even a prayer module to a okay, I get this now, what do I need to do now to create the space in my life to let those people that do serve me show up? And the big key word here is creating space within. And so having that space to let that happen is does require um, letting go of the people that are filling that space, you know? So and also, you know, there's different forms of relationships too. It could be that somebody is um having an ex as a friend let's just say but um they're not really they're not going back into the relationship sector but they're still really in you know in touch and they're they're filling their time with each other 
but that's also limiting the um, the progress and it's limiting who would be available to them if they kind of step out of their comfort zone. So it just requires stepping out into the unknown and trusting that when you give that energy, you give permission to let what is meant for you or what's meant for your highest good to appear, it will. Yeah. And it does. Yeah. yeah. I think um, I'm going to use myself as an example again. <laughs> Here's something uh, I personally struggle with when making decisions about letting go of something. Let's let's call it a relationship because I, I struggle with some, someone who can see uh, pros and cons for both sides. And I can also see like, oh, I can understand why this person is behaving in this way. And what is my role in creating that dynamic and relationship? And so I want, I want to give the person the benefit of the doubt. I want to understand how I'm influencing that reaction and that kind of, let's say it is toxic, right? Um, that toxic kind of energy between the two of us when we show up. But let's say it's somebody that, you know, who a lifelong friend, not lifelong, but, you know, decades long friend who's been in our lives for a long, long time, who's, you know, we have a lot of really good memories with, we still have really good moments with them, but it's just like a challenge. You show up in this relationship and it's just hard, maybe more often than it's easy. Would you say that's a sign <laughs> I think I'm 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 struggling with finding the clarity of like okay it's time to really just let that relationship go it served its purpose and there's something there's something to unpack here there's something to learn from each other and perhaps we can stay connected and find a way to move through this when do you know it's time to let go you know it's not a it's not a one size fits all question but I really know that on a soul level that every person that we encounter is there for a purpose and a reason. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a karmic situation, right? And so when you look at it from that higher perspective of like someone being there as a teacher for you and you learning a lesson, then it does take off that kind of feeling of judgment um, and it allows you to have more compassion for the individual. But there are times though, there are people in our lives for a reason or a season or a lifetime. And so when we're able to, again, um, kind of dissect that information and go, okay, um, this person has been in my life for the past two years and they're just, they're not seeing who I am. You know, I'm having to kind of dim my light around them. Mm -hmm. Then we can kind of go to the standpoint of, okay, my lesson here is learning that I'm not going to let anyone or give anyone the power to control that light of who I am, you know? And so in that sense, they're a teacher for them, but we also have families as well, you know, and we have people that we can't necessarily cut out of our lives. I totally get that. I'm not trying to suggest that unless it's something that's very, very um, destructive, you know, something that's abusive or something that's really just um, dangerous for you, then that's a different story. But for something to do with someone who is rubbing you the wrong way, I, I always say, what is it about that person that's a reflection of yourself as well? Because when you look at it from that standpoint, we're all reflections of each other on our journey. It's just about understanding from our standpoint, what works for us or what we're willing or not willing to allow into our orbit or into our sphere. Yeah. Mm, I find that so helpful. And you said, you mentioned karmic web. I believe you said karmic web, right? And I know you dedicate a chapter to this, which is called spiritual web. Um, and so I wanted, I wanted to unpack that a little bit. What do we mean when we say spiritual web? I think we all kind of have a general understanding of what karma I think in general, I don't know if I could say I personally really truly get what karma means, um, but that broader universal lens of the spiritual web, who we come into contact with, uh, the choices we make in relationship, who shows up in our life when, um, I, I just love to hear you talk about that more. Yeah, the spiritual web for me is just about everything being interconnected. Um, I actually uh, coined that phrase though, because when I was first understanding my own abilities um, in the very beginning of this, when I was like a teenager, I remember um, feeling this sensation on my face like I was walking through a spider web mm -hmm. and I, I could not make sense of it. And I was like, why am I having, I, I kept like trying to peel away 
hairs off my face or this web off my face. And then I, I realized in time what was going on. It was just spirit giving me a different kind of awareness of this sort of clairsentient and this clear feeling. But it was very, very intense for a moment there for me until I until I got the aha moment with it. And then it subsided. Um, but, you know, we come into this life with a, with this soul contract, with this agenda. And, you know, it's something like where you come when you have a roadmap in front of you, let's just say, and you go, OK, I'm going to Texas. I'm going to stop here at this roadblock on this street. But your free will will always dictate how you get from point A to point B in your life. When we incarnate into this world, we are just kind of picking up where we left off with those souls that we're traveling with through eternity. And so each person, I believe too, even down to the acquaintances or the people that you see at the grocery store, all of these still, you know, interconnectedness, these are things that we have experienced previously in different lifetimes and in different forms. Um, so when we look at it from that perspective, I believe it helps us see that we're always learning in this life, you know, and going to the other level of this now with our web, our spiritual web, just as we have those souls that are here incarnate right now, we also have those discarnate souls around us too. And we are all woven into the same fabric with them. So we have our deceased loved ones, we have our guides, we have angels, we have ascended masters, we have so many different variations of who's supporting us on our journey too. And so I really feel like when we're able to tap into that awareness for, for ourselves individually, then we're able to see the correlation that we're never truly alone, even though our ego might convince us of that from time to time. And when we go into that space and we resonate with that space, then we're able to see the larger picture of life that we're not just here for this moment to pay bills and die. We're actually here to connect soul to soul, both on this side and with both on the other side as well. And what a gift that is when we, when we are able to recognize that, that knowing. Yeah. I'm thinking a, a lot about, I love how in the book you offer so many different practices um, from meditations to like journal exercises um, and I'm thinking about, I'm, I'm curious, I'm always curious to, to hear about what our guests, um, maybe rituals, daily practices, it doesn't have to be a daily practice, but things that you really resonate with that help you stay grounded in who you are doing the work that you're doing, inspired to get up daily to do this work, what kind of practices, rituals, whatever you want to call it to you regularly visit in your life so one thing that has stuck with me since my childhood and it, you know um i believe with many different healers on the planet right now that um there's there's usually this trauma that that happens to us that really shows us this duality of why we're here and shows us a different way of being and so um i'm brought back to my childhood when i went through a lot of that trauma myself one thing that was always consistent for me was this energy force surrounding me. Um, and so I refer to it now as this, this force field of light around me. And when I was a child, I didn't know what to label it as really. All I knew is that when I was in a traumatic event or situation, I was able to sort of go within and feel that protection around me. Um, and so this is something that I still use every day of my life. And so I um, I refer to it as the white light, you know, or the light of spirit, the light of God. And uh, it starts for me the moment that I get up in the morning, actually, because it became so accustomed and so routine for me. It's like breathing for me at this point. So um, when I wake up in the morning, before I get out of bed, actually, I will just envelop myself in that light source energy. And what that does is it pulls me out of like the, the rational part of my thinking that wants to kind of dictate everything throughout the day for me and control everything. It actually allows me to sort of surrender what I think should be happening and just trust that when I give it to that light source, everything unfolds exactly as it should. Now, when there's moments throughout my day where maybe I'm not as consistent with it, or I'm going against the grain because I'm only human as well, you know, what happens is that I'm, I'm able to recognize, okay, 
I see now. I need to I need to shift my awareness and shift my thinking back into the space. And once I do that, it's always such a little giggle moment for me to see how things line up for me and are aligned for me when I have that way of practice and that way of thinking. And it's something that we're all given, we all have access to. And it it almost sounds like too easy to be true. And, and it really is actually that easy. <laughs> so I, I feel like um, using that energy, using that visualization too, it also raises my frequency. It, it plugs me into a different source of vibration. Um, being, being a musician from my previous self, everything for me has a vibrational quality to it. You know, I hear a lot of things and I also use different tonalities actually to like lift or manipulate the space that I'm in. So um, using using that that light source leads me to an intention as well. And I have a, a beautiful practice in soul searching too that really shows how to use that intention. And I believe it's life changing when people give their energy and their focus and their intention to that way of being because it shows them how responsible they are for their journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The choice, the, the, um, I want to say autonomy, but that's not the right word. It's, it's the choice to choose. What is the word I'm thinking of? Um, do you know what I'm trying to say? Um, well, I'm going to go back to using the word intention because I feel yeah. like it, go it goes back to intention and it goes back to, having the ability to sort of redirect our energy and redirect our thoughts as well. You know, we, part of having, being in this human experience is recognizing that we're always going to be walking this tightrope between our rational side and our, and our all knowing um, intuitive side, you know, mm -hmm. and when we're able to find that balance with it, then we're able to make um, even just more informed decisions as well we're able to have a dialogue with our inner self, with our higher self. And that inner dialogue is just paramount to living um, a more useful life or a life that has more meaning to it. Because when you're in that, when you're in that space of energy, life looks brighter to you. Yeah, for sure. My dogs think so too, actually. So, okay. <laughs> What's that? Say that My again. My dogs agree with you. My dogs are barking. Oh, oh, I can't hear them. Well, I'm glad they agree. Thank you, dogs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of dogs do you have? I have three dogs. I have an Alaskan Malamute, a little um, Dachshund, and a, and a Lab. Actually. Hmm. What a great mixture of dogs. Do they get along with each other? They do. My neighbors refer to them as the Motley Crew. I think it's hilarious. Um, and they're just the best of friends, actually. And we all oh. have a great relationship together. That's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> I love animals. They're the best. Yeah. Um, I have four animals myself, two dogs, wow. two cats. And I ask about animals getting along because we've adopted animals at different points in their own respective lives. So it's always kind of like a readjustment, especially for cats, a readjustment process of like, okay, there's a new being in the house that we have to learn how to get along with. I have no idea if that's what they're thinking, but in my mind, I'm, I like to think of like, Hey everyone, let's get on board. We're a family. Let's love each other. <laughs> That was a process, but I feel like after a couple of weeks, couple of months, then that's what happens just naturally, you know, being yeah. part of the tribe, you know. Yeah, definitely. I feel the same. Thank goodness. <laughs> I did have one follow-up question on this subject of, um, in terms of ritual practices, um, meditation, setting intentions, especially you mentioned it's something that you do kind of like breathing when you wake up in the morning. Um you know, I hear so many people say, for example, meditation, I can't meditate because I can't, you know, sit still for that long. I can't let my mind stop thinking, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The, the kids need me. I need to take the animals out. Um, and I think about that time, that space in the morning, I'm, I'm visualizing you waking up and just having this be kind of an automatic response to waking up and wondering what would you say to the person that wakes up, you know, maybe they go to bed with the intention. Okay. I'm going to start this new practice. I'm going to develop this new habit and behavior, 
but for some reason I just forget, or for some reason, you know, the alarm clock goes off and I mean, that'll put you in a, a state of fight or flight, depending on <laughs> what your alarm clock sounds like, but how do we slow it down? How do we remember to pause? And yes, we all can take 30 seconds, one minute, even five minutes. We can all take five minutes. That thing, whatever it is, whatever the the thing that you have to go and do right now, it can wait five minutes, I promise. How do we remember that though and and allow ourselves to give ourselves that five minutes? It's a great question too. Um, So this is the role of the ego. The ego wants to always kind of keep you distracted from that true part of yourself. And so um, what, what works for me may work for someone else, but I also am really good about um, writing down things in a journal too. You know, I feel like writing down our thoughts or intentions, it has a way of just magnifying that frequency or the energy source. So for, for me, writing something down will remind me to be in that intention as well. But, you know, for everyone, meditation will look different. You know, for some people, meditation is jogging and being out in nature and walking their dogs. That's meditation because it's grounding you. It's connecting you with um, an, an external source and also an internal source. And it's giving you time to kind of disconnect from your phone for a minute, you know, and to kind of disconnect from the outside material world. Um, something else that I that I that really helps me to, and it goes back to my to my musician um, part of myself, is chanting actually. And I got into chanting years ago now, but um, chanting for me is also a form of meditation because it also helps focus my intention on the sound and the, and the vibration of the sound. And that has a lot of power too for me to kind of manipulate my energy or manipulate the space around me. Um, and it helps me be more in that flow. So I really think it just depends on what works for each individual. You know, for some people, it's going to be, um, working out, exercising. For some people, it's going to be taking a bath. So I would say if you can incorporate something with that mindfulness in something that you already like doing, blending those two pieces together, that's what's going to keep you um, going back for more of it when you see how it makes you feel. Once you see how it makes you feel, once you get out of the chatty Cathy mindset and you sit in the stillness for a couple of minutes, um, it's... (laughs) It's miraculous because it it's like having so much energy built up by just sitting in that presence and that stillness. It's very underestimated, actually. But when we give ourselves even like two or three minutes of it, and we're and we're truly just surrendering to our breath and not trying to f- control anything, then we're allowing that that energy source to really ramp up through us. And that's when we're able to feel our connection to everything else around us. Mm, great answer. Mm. The nuance too is, is helpful to remember. Oh, it doesn't have to look the same as it, it does for my neighbor or my partner or my best friend. It can be what I make it. Mm-hmm. Um, I have one more question about practices. And this is a great practice that you offer in the book, which I love, and it's around boundaries. Um, (laughs) uh, The cord cutting or cutting cords practice. Can you tell us about this? Yeah, you know, so just like we're all interconnected, what we don't always realize is that even when you pick up the phone and call somebody, there is an energy, there is a cord of energy that's that is attaching from you to them. And also it could be when you go to the store too and you leave the store and you're like, why am I in a bad mood right now? You know, what what's going on? Um, and it could also be to um, maybe an experience from your past that keeps attaching itself to you. Like maybe a bad breakup, for example, that 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 keeps reactivating and keeps, keeps you in the past and from moving forward. So it just really depends on the scenario. But Um, What I love doing is through visualization, somehow dissolving those cords that just don't work for me. And also not just that, but it also creates, I find when I'm able to detach those cords from me, I pull back my power to myself again. And it's something that we all should be doing more of in our lives because it's the reason why we feel so off and 
low and these these sort of lower energy frequencies is because we are too spread thin. Our energy is leaking out of us to other people and individuals, or it's being sucked out of us by different individuals too. And so you can still maintain a beautiful relationship with somebody by just still taking back your power by cutting the cord. And um, what I use in soul searching is just an example of how to do that. But there's many different ways that will resonate with each person for them to really disconnect those energy cords as well. Yeah, thank you. That's such a cool practice. Um, I wanted, so I mentioned when I was introducing you uh, in your bio that one of your life's missions is to help people deal with grief um, and losing loved ones. And so I wanted to... I don't really have a specific question around this topic, but I wanted to hear you talk a little bit about it. Um, and if you you do have any words of wisdom to share, since it is your life's mission, it's work that you're familiar with. Um, will you talk to us about grief and loss? Absolutely. You know, um, people come to see me for various reasons. You know, um, some come to see me for guidance on their life's path or for decision making. Um, but for the majority of those that I that I read for, it's because they're looking for that confirmation that their loved ones is, is, is around them. And so what what I have come to the um agreement with spirit is that grief and the energy of grief is the accumulation of so much love that we have for that soul and also for ourselves and also through lifetimes as well. And it can be really just so painful. And I I know that myself because I've been through that myself as well. But when I'm able to view it from a different perspective of the love aspect, and that is the feeling that perhaps I am or I was associating with a negative association because, well, that's what I saw in society, you know. Mm -hmm. When I was able to flip my way of thinking about it and see that, it is just, it, it is our, it is the unlimited feeling of love flowing through us. And it's so overwhelming that it can break us open and it leads us to having the tears flow, you know, and all of this release as well, right? Um, so when I am channeling for others and bringing through spirit, my intention is always um, in a very gentle way, of course, for the other side to be able to validate what is the most important thing that they need to hear right now, you know, and sometimes it's as trivial as me saying blue to somebody, you know what I mean? But um, what it comes down to is just knowing that, that we're never alone. So um, a lot of times when I'm, when I'm reading for somebody, um, they will do, spirit will do what I call current events. And so they'll talk about things that were happening recently in someone's life. It may have actually been that morning as well, or how they're showing up for them too. And it's always so amazing to me to see how that correlation um, takes place when I'm giving a reading. Because when someone hears that their mother was, you know, with them in the bathroom and, you know, put the ladybug on the, on the dresser or whatever. And it's so specific to them. It just, it releases this sort of questioning of, are they really around me? So what I love about being a medium is being able to show people and give them those insights to let them know, like, keep looking for the signs because once you recognize how they're showing up for you, they're going to keep doing it, especially when you're in your most rational, doubtful moment. That's when they're going to be doing it the most because they're wanting to show you. I'm right there by your side, but you have to look. You have to keep looking. So um, what I also love to do, too, in addition, when I'm giving a reading is showing people, keep an open eye for this. You know, keep this with you. Um, and that's always a great part, too, about a reading is that a spirit might bring through, a, you know, a, a specific situation, whether it be a symbol or so, something more than that. And the person that I'm reading for is like, I don't know what that means right now. But then like days later, it'll be very apparent to them. And for me, it's just a trust in myself and trust in what I'm receiving and knowing that 
time is not of the essence with the other side. Time is just an illusion, you know? So when I'm being given that information and those downloads, for me, it's about trusting it, sharing it, and then seeing the unveiling of it through time. And that for me is so rewarding to see with those that I work with. Mm, yeah. And then on, on that thread as well, I wanted to, I guess the last, last topic would be in the dream realm, um, visitations from spirit in the dream realm. Um, I know it's something that you talk about as well. Um, and also, I guess, discerning what is spirit visitation um, and then the opposite of that, which I'll let you um, unpack that for us. <laughs> Absolutely. The first thing I want to say about this is that our imagination is the platform for spirit to connect with us. That's how they do this primarily. Um, so, of course, when we're in the dream space and we're in that imaginative space, they're able to come around us because we have no rationale going on. You know, we're completely operating from our spirit self. And that's when spirit's able to show us that they're whole again, that they're happy again, you know. Um, but again, on that same level, a true spirit visitation will always make you feel uplifted and loved and connected. And typically, um, spirit will be surrounded in that same light source that I spoke about earlier. That's how you know. Now, when I was um, younger, my mom passed away and I had that beautiful experience with her. There was a time afterwards where I had some not very pleasant experiences in my dream state uh, that were very sort of negative or, you know, um, made me feel very fearful, actually. And so I, I know that people go through that way as well when they're dreaming. So the telltale sign to know if your grief is working through you or if you're having a true spirit visitation is to pay attention to how you feel when you're in that experience. If you're feeling this sort of outpouring of love and this, this kind of reunion sensation, right? Um, and it's light around you. And um, a lot of times too, they don't say anything. They just kind of stand there looking at you, just smiling, you know? That's a true visitation. Now, if the if the soul is like yelling at you or doing something that's out of character or they don't seem they seem unrest, for example, that is a conjuring of what's going on in the subconscious to sort of deal with the grief of the situation. So once we're able to recognize that and discern, okay, the yin to the yang, the positive and the negative, then we can truly have this agenda and this sort of communication with spirit where we're telling them, okay, I am open and receptive to you showing up for me in the most beautiful way where I will be able to recognize you in my dream space. And so when people get into that, that way of communication and that way of, of having this intention set, it's, the, you know, there, it's, there's limitless possibilities as to what you will experience once you go into the dream space. Mm, I love that. I can't wait to go to sleep tonight. And dream. <laughs> it's true. And, you know, also for anyone too, who might be beyond a spirit, maybe you want to like, you know, manifest something in the world too. I always encourage them right before you're going to sleep, just focus on that within the center of your, of your clairvoyance, you know? So if someone's wanting to experience love, for example, you know, have them visualize just the word love as they're going to sleep and they're bringing that power with them into um, their, their, their dream space. And it's amazing what shows up with that intention when we wake up in the morning too. Yeah. Some of my most powerful, do you ever have those dreams where uh, you wake up and you're like, oh, I have to write this down. I just learned X, Y, and Z. That was so profound. What an amazing story. Oh my gosh. I have to remember this. I mean, that kind of dream. I used to have those dreams often it's when I was in college. Remember I talked about being in college, feeling innocent, not yet quite jaded by adulthood. Um, maybe there's something to that. Hmm. <laughs> so Bill, I want to um, wrap us up by asking you if there's anything that I didn't ask you that you were hoping to speak to 
And if not, if there's any key takeaway that you hope readers will get from your new book, Soul Searching. One thing I also want to speak about um, in terms of soul searching is something else that is very, very universal for all of us. It's also very simple, but it also has a lot of powerful results. And it's just gratitude. I know that it sounds like, okay, yeah, I, I say thank you, I get it. But when you are able to sort of tune in to that energy of gratitude, you cannot exist in the fear space of yourself. You cannot exist in the rational part of yourself. So it really does pull you out of that way of being and it gives you the opportunity to vibe yourself higher, you know, to connect with the synchronicities around you that spirit's leaving behind. But it also helps, I feel too, um, amplify our, our force field or our orbit and what we're pulling into our orbit as well. And it's something as simple as just thinking or saying the words, thank you. Um, and this goes back to as well, all the different concepts and visualizations that Spirit gave to me for this book um, are all geared really to helping someone enter that inner world where everything really exists, where they're able to connect with Spirit connect with their own divinity and to know that ultimately you are in the driver's seat and you've been given this incredible opportunity to use that magic within yourself to truly create what you're wanting to experience in the world around you and never to give your power away to know how powerful you truly are. So I really hope that everyone who reads Soul Searching takes that away with it. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for being with us today, Bill. Um, I do want to point out that uh, for those of you listeners that definitely want to pick up this book, that want to know more about Bill, his website is his name, Bill Phillips, and Phillips is P-H-I-L-I-P-P-S. So there's two P's and one L in the last name, um, and that's .com. And I'll make sure these links get into our show notes so that you can easily just click the more info button, click on the website, and then there you are. Um, <clears throat> and also one last thing is you do work with, you do work with people one-on-one -on -one for readings or is it small groups now? I, I do, I do individual readings as well. I do group reads and audience readings, but I also teach workshops as well around okay. the country. Yeah. And all that information is on your website as well. Yes. Wonderful. Well, Bill, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to have you on the show, to get to speak with you today. And it's just an honor to have this body of work in my hands. So thank you for sharing it with us, with me and us. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's equal, equally an honor to be here with you today. And thanks again. Yeah. Oh. Well, everyone, that concludes another amazing episode of Outside the Studio. I hope you enjoyed yourself. I hope you learned something knew, maybe remembered something old, maybe felt inspired to apply something to your life. My, <laughs> you can hear my dog in the background. She's doing a little happy dance. Um, so Daisy enjoyed it. Anyhow, I wanted to just pop in here to wrap us up to say a couple of things. Number one, I have such an amazing team that helps me put these podcasts together. Without them, I wouldn't you know, be able to bring these amazing conversations to you. So thank you to my producer, my director of creative services, my sound editor, my um, engineer, Consistency Media. Don't know what I would do without you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And the amazing creation and artistic, musical, genius, Drew Lovern, thank you so much for putting together this music for specifically for outside the studio. So unique to the show, only place you're ever gonna hear it is right here. Thanks you guys, you make my world go around. Stay well, everyone. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe, rate and review, share on the socials, especially if it's a show that you think, hey, this could help somebody else. That's what this is all about, right? We're sharing information so that we're better, um, so that we're inspired, so that we're lifting each other up and we're learning how to be in this world, living on this planet to the best of our ability, sharing information 
and inspiring one another. And that's my hope. That's my hope for the show. Take care. <laughs>